Um, I'll be turning things over here to the director of the Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute, Professor N. Ashokan, um, to introduce our keynote today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Heather. Uh, it's also my pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of uh, Waterloo Cybersecurity and Privacy Institute, or CPI, like Heather mentioned. CPI represents uh, cybersecurity and privacy experts at the University of Waterloo in many different disciplines, cutting across all our faculties and institutes. And uh, uh, people like uh, Professor Heather Lau are members of uh, CPI among about uh, over 50 members. Uh, and like you said, she said, today's keynote is a joint event between CPI. And for those of you who are coming from uh, uh, registered via CPI, the other uh, party is 2021 IEEE International Symposium on Technology and Society, or ISTAS. Uh, like Heather said, it's the last in the series of events that CPI has been holding during October to mark Cybersecurity Month and it is the first keynote of ISTAS. Uh, we are all privileged to have a world leading expert delivering this keynote. Uh, Professor Ron Gibert has been at the forefront of uh, understanding and explaining how technology affects human society. Uh, as the director of Citizen Lab, he has led uh, significant work on various topics in this theme, ranging from internet censorship, uh, surveillance and espionage. I'm sure most of you have come across his works in the form of his several books, uh, groundbreaking citizen lab reports, and his many media appearances. Uh, he's a professor of political science with the Monk School of uh, Monk School at the University of Toronto, which is also where Citizen Lab is based in. So please uh, join me in inviting Professor Ron Dieber to deliver his keynote on investigating targeted espionage. Thank you so much. Well, listen, let me get right to it by asking everybody in the audience who owns an Apple product. I just realized I can't see everybody raising their hands, but I'm guessing there are quite a few of you who do. Uh, the reason I want to start there is because if you do own an Apple product, you're one of the 1.6 billion people who last month received an emergency security patch uh, from Apple that was issued after we released this report called Forced Entry. Um, this report emerged when we discovered that a Saudi activist who was enrolled in one of our research uh, programs had his phone hacked with a zero click, uh, zero day exploit against uh, all Apple products. A uh, zero click means there was no interaction on, on the part of the uh, target, uh, not, no attachments uh, with malicious links to click on. Uh, this was a, an exploit that could simply take over any Apple device. And it's known as a zero day in industry jargon because that means even the vendor, in this case, Apple, didn't know about the exploit. Um, so we did a responsible disclosure to Apple when we discovered this, shared with them uh, the, um, the spyware that we were able to capture in the wild. And they, within six days, remarkably fast, issued this security patch. Uh, the spyware came from a company called NSO Group, which is an Israel-based mercenary spyware firm that has been the subject of many citizen lab reports and reports of other organizations, probably heard about their flagship spyware called Pegasus uh, this summer uh, as part of the Pegasus project news stories. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today. Uh, the company has been, as I said, the subject of many citizen lab reports. Uh, when the company communicates, they say pretty consistently the following messages. We only sell to governments, we follow Israeli and local laws, and our product, our spyware, very powerful surveillance technology is strictly controlled to investigate criminals and terrorists. Well, uh, the first two remarks are absolutely true, as far as I can tell. Uh, the third, however, is not. Uh, in fact, uh, the main takeaway of my presentation today is to describe to you the results of the investigations we've done into the commercial spyware market, including uh, the technology sold by NSO Group and other companies. And what we have found is that contrary to this last claim, uh, the spyware technology is widely abused. And in fact, I'm, I've come to the belief that this is one of the most serious crises of global civil society, of liberal democracy that we face right now. This marketplace is out of control and it's causing widespread harm. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about today. But first, let me say a few remarks about the Citizen Lab. For those of you who don't know what, you, what we do, as was mentioned at the outset, I'm the founder and still the director of the Citizen Lab. 
we're based at the University of Toronto. So we're very much a university-based research group. We do research on digital security, but we don't cover the entire space. It's a very large area, cybersecurity, privacy, et cetera. We approach these topics from the perspective of human rights, from a human-centric perspective, which limits our focus to some degree. Uh, the real signature of the Citizen Lab is our mixture of methods. We really truly do interdisciplinary research. I'm a social scientist. My area of expertise is international security. Most of the people who work at the lab come from other disciplines. We especially leverage the technical disciplines, computer science, engineering science, as well as law and area studies to do the reporting uh, that we do. Uh, we're not an advocacy group, we're not an activist group. Um, we see ourselves as doing very careful, evidence-based, peer-reviewed, data-driven research in the public interest. One way to think about this, I've, I've used this several times, even though I don't watch the show, uh, someone once described us as a CSI of human rights. I think, you know what, that's kind of accurate um, with the, uh, I guess, exception that we're based at, at a university and we're very much approaching this from an academic uh, perspective. So what I wanna do to begin is walk through three cases featuring three victims of NSO's Pegasus spyware. And the reason I want to um, profile these three cases is just to select out among literally more than many hundreds, uh, the most serious cases in my mind that demonstrate the harms around this type of poorly regulated Wild West marketplace. So let me begin with this person, Ahmed Mansour, human rights defender in the UAE. Back in 2016, Ahmed received these two text messages. Uh, he was wary of them, even though they looked enticing. They described evidence of torture in Emirati prisons, something he might be tempted to look at. Instead, he forwarded them to us at the Citizen Lab for analysis. And Bill Marzak, senior researcher at the Citizen Lab, uh, clicked on those links using a device in the lab uh, that he infected, and he was able to actually capture uh, the spyware. This was the first time we, we actually, anyone outside of NSO itself or its government clients had access to the spyware. We reverse engineered it, we examined it, and ever since that time, we've been tracking the company's uh, command and control infrastructure, and also tracking down a lot of the abusive targeting that's been going on around the world. But this was the first time. Uh, we also did a responsible dis disclosure at that time to Apple, and they issued an emergency security patch back in 2016. Uh, that was the first time we did something like that with Pegasus. This is very powerful spyware technology. So the, the reason that governments crave this sort of thing is that they can do a lot with it. Um, so had Ahmad Mansour clicked on those links, his phone would have been silently commandeered, allowing the government operators, in this case, the United Arab Emirates, to basically do anything they want on his device, to read all emails and text messages, even those that are end-to-end -end encrypted, listen in on phone calls, uh, track the geolocation of the target, follow them around, turn on the audio capture mechanisms and the video, effectively turning that device into a uh, silent wiretap. And as I said, this was very sophisticated. It, this particular exploit chain back in 2016 involved not just one, but three separate Apple uh, zero days. So companies like NSO Group, their uh, proprietary product, if you will, is this ability to identify uh, flaws in software applications that are used widely that they can essentially weaponize uh, for their government clients in this manner. Um, the sad coda to this story is the government got tired of trying to hack into Ahmad Mansour's device and they threw him into prison. Uh, he remains there to this day in solitary confinement, a 10 year sentence uh, for something like insults to the regime. Uh, keep that in mind because it's a good example of how in the eye of the beholder, what constitutes criminal behavior or terrorism can be very, very broad leading to this type of abuse of targeting of this very powerful surveillance technology when it's in the hands of autocrats and dictators. Uh, here's a second victim, Javier Hardenas. Uh, Javier is an investigative journalist in Mexico. Uh, he specialized as part of a news organization there on uh, the drug cartels and government corruption. 
a very dangerous beat in Mexico. Unfortunately, uh, one day he was gunned down in the streets of Mexico. Uh, his laptop and his cell phone were stolen. Nothing else was taken. And um, everyone attributed this to a cartel linked hit. Uh, the day after he was murdered, his editor at the newspaper received this text message, which we were able to positively attribute to NSO's infrastructure based on the exploit link. So you can see here what's going on is they're trying to trick this uh, editor into clicking on a link to take over the phone. Uh, not only did they target the editor, uh, they also went after Javier's wife, who you can see here was in mourning. Uh, they sent her uh, messages, emotional messages, uh, trying to trick her into clicking on the link. This case is also very instructive because NSO Group touts its spyware as assisting governments investigate serious matters of crime and terrorism, like investigations into the drug cartel. What happened here was its spyware was used actually to target uh, uh, family members and associates of a journalist who was murdered for investigating links between the drug cartel and the Mexican government. Um, a third victim, uh, this is Omar Abdulaziz, Canadian permanent resident. Uh, basically, uh, Omar is like the Stephen Colbert of the Gulf region. Uh, he, he came to Canada, sought asylum, and runs a YouTube channel, has a social media presence where he basically mocks or satirizes Mohammed bin Salman. They really don't like him. Uh, so back in 2018, Omar uh, happened to be um, shopping for something on Amazon. He made a purchase. A few hours later, he received this fake DHL courier notification. Um, we were able to determine uh, with his permission after looking at this, uh, that that domain there, sundaydeals.com, was part of NSO Group's infrastructure. And he accidentally clicked on this, or he, he was tricked into clicking on the link, and his device was infected. Um, what we didn't know at the time that we did this investigation and published our report was that Omar Abdulaziz and Jamal Khashoggi, the murdered Washington Post journalists, were very close friends. They had been communicating for months over what they thought were secure WhatsApp messages, planning social media activism and political mobilization against Mohammed bin Sal Salman and the Saudi regime. Uh, what they were discussing was very provocative. Here's a couple of examples that Omar shared. Um, you can see they're um, talking about, you know, we're gonna build this electronic army. Uh, we're gonna call it the bees. Uh, and then um, Omar said, um, you know, uh, geez, I think somebody's hearing about this and how do they know? Well, what they didn't know at the time until we uh, alerted Omar was that the Saudi regime was effectively listening in on everything uh, that they were doing. And we know exactly how that all ended up. Um, in fact, our report was published October 1st, 2018. The very next day, October 2nd, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, went missing and was executed in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, Turkey. Now, the interesting thing about all of these three victims that I've profiled here are these links that are sent to victims and there's some kind of social engineering in the message because the goal here is to trick a target into clicking on a link. That was very useful for us as investigators because as I said, we had begun mapping over years NSO's command and control system. We knew which domains they were using uh, to try to trick people. We had a pretty good sense anyway. So when uh, someone would be targeted with this spyware, even if they didn't click on a link, the uh, uh, socially engineered text message and the domain uh, that was part of the, the malicious link are like uh, forensic artifacts. We could look at this and as investigators say, yes, for sure, we can say this person was targeted or maybe they clicked on the link. Well, things began to change around 2019 when NSO developed a very sophisticated version of its spyware, which I mentioned at the outset, that involves no click, zero click uh, spyware. And we saw as a consequence, many more victims, many more cases of abuse. Uh, the first instance of this zero click that we came across in the wild 
involved uh, NSO's exploitation in a flaw at that time in the WhatsApp message protocol. So um, we learned of this, spoke to the engineers at WhatsApp. They had been investigating uh, separately and identified uh, what they saw was a flaw in their uh, application. They pushed out an emergency security patch. Then they went out and actually um, took the data from a two week period of time that they had, shared it with us at the Citizen Lab after an agreement was reached with them on how we would do this that properly protected the privacy and confidentiality of everyone involved. And we started investigating and actually notifying the victims of this two week period for which we had data. And what we saw was really a worldwide tsunami of these people who were targeted in this manner. Uh, in, in, uh, it included in India, uh, dozens of journalists, uh, lawyers, human rights activists, um, Rwandans who had fled Rwanda and had been targeted or their friends murdered by death squads that were sent out by President Paul Kagame. Uh, a whole number of people involved in the Catalan independence movement in Spain, we also verified were targeted. Even a Roman Catholic bishop and priest in the small African country of Togo, uh, we discovered were also targeted in this manner. So really, as I say, an epidemic of abuses. And our investigations continued. Uh, we came across um, a, a, a really astonishing set of cases involving uh, the hacking of um, journalists, producers, anchors, and executives at Al Jazeera, and a second journalist at a London-based news organization who all had their phones hacked using this zero-click uh, spyware. Um, we published our report in December 2020. Um, this was done in collaboration with the IT security team at Al Jazeera. We were able to get uh, uh, data from all of these people with their consent examined. We have a new method for looking at forensically looking at devices, and we were able to confirm this. But really, when you think about it, it's astonishing. 36 journalists, producers, anchors at Al Jazeera, all hacked by whom? Uh, likely Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates combined, all uh, definitively proven by us using Pegasus spyware. So that's a pretty uh, big deal. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, many of you might have heard of Pegasus or even first learned of it this summer as part of something called the Pegasus Project. Um, the Pegasus Project involved an unprecedented leak of more than 50,000 phone numbers, uh, which someone leaked to uh, Amnesty International and Forbidden Stories, which is a consortium of investigative journalists. What this leak of phone numbers appeared to be uh, was not Pegasus itself, but rather data that was used by uh, NSO's government clients to do a kind of reconnaissance of, of targets. And among the people on that list were numerous uh, journalists, uh, lawyers, human rights activists, academics, friends and family members, uh, even major politicians, cabinet members, diplomats, heads of state, including notoriously uh, French President Emmanuel Macron's number was also on this list. Um, what happened was as part of the investigation, Amnesty International Security Lab went out and with the help of the journalists who are part of this consortium, uh, with the consent of some of these targets, actually forensically examine their devices. And a significant, very substantial number have, of them have been proven to be hacked with Pegasus spyware. So there's a pretty strong correlation between this list of phone numbers and people who were eventually hacked, which suggests this theory, this hypothesis, hypothesis that this was a kind of reconnaissance going on is pretty accurate. We at Citizen Lab uh, participate in this project by providing an independent peer review of Amnesty's methods. And we've also been involved in forensically uh, 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 analyzing uh, a selection of these phones. So what you have here with Pegasus Project is like an amplification of previous findings in every possible direction, just widespread global significant abuse of this very powerful 
commercial surveillance technology. And the, and the research uh, continues right up until a few days ago, uh, we released this report where we determined uh, New York Times journalist Ben Hubbard uh, was hacked uh, multiple times. Uh, in fact, even after we had published a report about Ben being targeted in 2018, um, he complained to NSO Group. They claimed that the Citizen Labs report was made up. Well, after that report came out, very high profile in the New York Times, uh, with Ben's consent, using our new forensic methods, we examined his devices and we could find the exact dates uh, that he was infected in July 2020 and June 2021. These were both after we published uh, that initial report. And this was also a zero click attack. Um, ben had this great uh, description of it. It felt like being robbed by a ghost. Uh, so again, to emphasize here, the latest iteration of Pegasus spyware involves no interaction with a target. There's nothing to be tricked by. In fact, uh, most people wouldn't even know this is occurring. There's no visible evidence of tampering. Only through some kind of detailed forensic analysis are we able to trace some kind of abnormalities that we can link uh, to Pegasus. Now, the story gets a little bleaker here, I'm sorry to say. We've been talking a lot about this one company, NSO Group. But they're not the only mercenary firm. The marketplace is large and growing. And in fact, the Citizen Lab has itself done numerous reports on many other companies. Let me go through a small selection going back many years. Uh, we did this extensive reporting on an Italian company that no longer exists called Hacking Team. Uh, here you can see we we're able to map some of its government clients, uh, most of them governments that have terrible human rights track records widespread um, abuse of, of uh, human rights and so on. Uh, the very next year, we did another report where we were able to uh, link uh, uh, government clients to this uh, UK-based, at the time, German-Swiss company. Uh, by the way, most of these companies have many different ownership groups and shell companies and third-party intermediaries and, and um, private equity funds. Makes it very difficult to to uh, often find out exactly where they're domiciled, uh, which is why I say, uh, in this case, UK, German, Swiss, it depends. Um, but this company is called Finn Fisher. Same story here. Um, numerous government clients, most of them are authoritarian regimes or illiberal, corrupt, whatever. Uh, they're not going to use this technology just to focus on what any reasonable person would call a criminal or a terrorist. They're gonna go after regime critics and others. Here's another interesting case. This is yet another spyware company. Uh, this one based in Israel called Cyberbit. Uh, we determined uh, that they sold technology to the government in Ethiopia, uh, a, a widely acknowledged uh, a, a country that abuses human rights. It's also one of the poorest countries of the world with less than something like 25% internet connectivity. But thanks to a company like Cyberbit, they can undertake a global cyber espionage operation, hitting targets, hacking their devices in dozens of countries around the world. We were able to positively identify some of the victims here, and they were all not surprisingly critics of the Ethiopian regime, including several academics. Interestingly, as part of this investigation, uh, the employees at Cyberbit made a mistake. They left a directory open in part of their infrastructure that we were analyzing on a server they controlled. And uh, among it, it, basically this directory had all of the victims of their spyware checking in very methodically. So we could see who was using Cyberbit's uh, technology and who the victims were. But included was a demonstration laptop that the company employees were using. And we could actually for eight months follow them around, as you can see here, as they gave demonstrations to prospective clients. Uh, so they check into the Radisson Blue Hotel, open up their demonstration laptop, check that their presentation is working. Next day, they go to the National Security Service in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Not a very uh, wonderful government there. Um, so a lot, a kind of rogues gallery for the most part here of potential customers that are going to abuse that product. Um, in July of this year, we produced a report on yet another 
uh, mercenary spyware firm, this one called Kandiru. This also involves zero days, in this case for Microsoft. Uh, we worked with Microsoft's Threat Intelligence Center. What was interesting about this particular case is that um, the infrastructure that we could analyze using internet scanning methods allowed us to identify some of the domains they were using to trick targets. And uh, the domains that we discovered included Black Lives Matter and Amnesty International websites. So you gotta ask yourself, what government client would want to have those domains used as part of their um, spying infrastructure? Obviously a government that is going to abuse that technology. Uh, yet another company, Circles, the reason I bring up this one, this is from a report in December of last year that we did. Again, we were able to scan this company's infrastructure because of a operational security mistake uh, that they made, allowing us to see all of their government clients. Same story here, uh, kind of rogues gallery of uh, human rights abusers for the most part. Um, Circles is not a spyware company per se. What they do is they exploit a, a little known vulnerability in the global cell network around a protocol called SS7. Uh, they essentially monetize access to the global cell uh, infrastructure, allowing them to market to their government clients the ability to identify the location of any cell phone in the world, and in some cases, intercept voice and text messages. So extremely powerful surveillance technology. Let me turn uh, to what is driving the growth of this commercial uh, spyware marketplace. Now, as I say here, the, the big explanation uh, for what is driving the growth is based. Everybody wants their own NSA these days. Um, but to drill down into a bit more historical detail, I believe the most important precipitating event for the growth of this marketplace was the Arab Spring, uh, which was about 10 years ago. Um, and as most of you all know, uh, that event uh, featured prominently the use of social media and digital technology by activists and protesters toppling these long-standing dictators. Everyone at the time attributed uh, the success of that movement to the technology. They said, this is a Twitter revolution, Facebook revolution, a mobile phone, uh, liberation technology uh, movement. Um, now, what happened was the autocrats and dictators around the world who were watching the same television broadcasts as you and I were, drew a completely different lesson. They said to themselves, and they turned to their security chiefs and consultants and said, how do we, ha how do we stop this from ever happening again? How do we neutralize them? Well, uh, standing in the wings was a large number of surveillance companies selling their wares at trade shows that are usually restricted to um, you know, arms exporters um, for law enforcement and government intelligence agencies at places like ISS World and others. And numerous companies have sprouted up. I love this company, Ability. Uh, they have this creepy uh, phrase, while others talk, we listen, uh, says it all. Um, so you have this very lucrative, uh, growing marketplace servicing the appetites of autocrats and dictators around the world to get their own version of the NSA uh, off the shelf, if you will. This is really a, what I call a kind of despotism as a service. And it's more than just uh, mercenary spyware. There are all sorts of technologies that range from data analytics, social media scraping, location tracking, involving artificial intelligence, uh, data interception, network traffic monitoring, deep packet inspection, and of course, the sticky sharp end of this inverted pyramid is the targeted spyware, which I believe is the most dangerous of them all because of the invasiveness uh, that it entails getting inside a person's phone is essentially getting inside uh, someone's life. And the real problem here is you can surmise by my presentation, who's a criminal, who's a terrorist? Well, it's all in the eye of the beholder when it comes to people um, like Erdogan, Putin, Modi or uh, Mohammed bin Salman, they're gonna go after regime critics, political opposition, anyone who's part of the accountability mechanism worldwide that's gonna hold them to account, they're gonna target with this type of spyware and there's really no control around it. On the flip side, 
we have this incredible market failure, an asymmetry of capacity and resources. So even though this industry does target um, private sector, you know, they target businesses occasionally, very much a, a hidden secret of the spyware industry is it's used for state on state espionage, hence the targeting of uh, French President Emmanuel Macron, uh, governments are going to spy on each other. But with those two sectors, at least they have a lot of resources, you know, they can go out and they can hire threat intelligence companies like Mandiant and FireEye to do investigations, build all sorts of firewalls and defenses to try to mitigate this type of attack. But for the average civil society organization, uh, they don't have anywhere near the capacity to deal with this type of high level nation state espionage involving some of the most sophisticated companies, many of whom are staffed by veterans of signals intelligence agencies. In fact, the typical NGO in the global south, uh, they're lucky if they have one person who deals with everything from you know, fixing the printer and the projector to dealing with this type of advanced persistent threat. So there's a huge asymmetry here that makes the problem worse, which is why I believe we're seeing a real crisis around civil society as you have this rising authoritarianism, uh, growing offensive doctrine normalization. By that, I mean just everyone developing offensive cyber attack capabilities worldwide. It's well documented. And this industry, alongside all of the companion products and services, private intelligence firms, uh, surveillance technologies, hack for hire organizations, ranging from small boutique ones based in India, all the way up to very professionalized uh, companies coming from Israel are now uh, creating um, this huge imbalance, really flipping on its head the lesson that many people took from the Arab Spring about the social impact of these technologies. Um, really, these technologies have become an Achilles heel for a large number of people worldwide who are being relentlessly targeted. Um, let me turn now about finally what to do, how to solve this problem. Well, I wish I had a very simple, happy message for you with five recommendations. Uh, unfortunately, it's pretty bleak here. I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned because there's no simple solution to this problem. That's not to say nothing can be done. In fact, uh, in part because of the reporting on this, especially around the Pegasus project and some other cases, we are beginning to see some movement. We're finally beginning to see governments take it very seriously. Uh, I will point out to you for one example, uh, the United States Department of Justice recently charged three American citizens uh, because they went off and worked for a espionage firm called Dark Matter uh, that was set up in the United Arab Emirates that went after journalists, human rights defenders, and even uh, targeted us at the Citizen Lab. Um, after these people were indicted, the US Department of Justice came out with this statement, left unregulated, the proliferation of offensive cyber capabilities undermines privacy and security worldwide. That's basically something that I would have written. Um, so it's uh, encouraging to see an, uh, an agency uh, saying something like that because it, it, it sends a message that they're going to hopefully take this seriously. I mentioned before about the finding concerning French President Emmanuel Macron's phone being tar among the target list. Uh, Israel and France have been in negotiations around this. This might, and cases like it, might actually wake governments up, especially liberal democratic governments, to the growing risks around this type of unregulated marketplace, not just for human rights, but it's become a national security issue as well. Uh, many of my colleagues have argued that it's time for a global moratorium. A couple of United Nations special rapporteurs said that. Um, I think this is a noble aspiration, but it's very unlikely to materialize anytime soon. Um, instead, I think there are some lower level things that we could do. For example, in Europe, there have been new regulations passed uh, on export controls. Um, police have been raiding some of these companies for violating some export controls. But even in spite of that progress, it's still a bit complicated because it turns out the German police themselves are actually customers of NSO Group. Um, so what this illustrates is that a lot of the governments 
have a dog in this race, it will be very difficult to get consensus around reigning in some of the worst abuses that we can attribute to this commercial marketplace as long as Western governments are involved as well. Meanwhile, I think the best short-term path forward is through litigation and hopefully criminal prosecution, which may involve um, passing legislation that would allow victims of this type of surveillance to sue companies like NSO Group for facilitating that, what is effectively a crime in many jurisdictions. And in fact, we've seen after the 2019 WhatsApp case, Facebook and WhatsApp have are they sued NSO Group, and that litigation proceeds in in U.S. courts. It's going to take a while. Um, there are a number of other uh, cases of litigation involving NSO Group or its government clients that are working their way through various courts and various jurisdictions. There are also, as I understand it, uh, at least one or more FBI investigations into NSO Group. If these uh, cases proceed and bring serious financial and other penalties to companies like NSO Group, that may make their ownership, um, which are usually these big uh, equity funds, uh, more risk averse. And that might be the best way to bring about some short-term reprieve of the type of harms that we're seeing. Meanwhile, as we wait for governments to wake up, as we wait for litigation to proceed, and we wait for new laws to be passed that enable victims to sue these type of companies, we have to uh, essentially fend for ourselves. Uh, and this is where uh, a multi-pronged community approach comes in. Effectively, this is what we're doing right now, continuing this evidence-based research alongside uh, investigative journalism to raise awareness about the problem. That's important. You need to show people this is a serious issue. We need to work on the capacity and defenses of civil society. Frankly, that's a very difficult task because as you've seen from my presentation, there really is no defense against the latest iteration of the most sophisticated versions of the spyware, but that doesn't mean there's not a lot of low hanging fruit around digital hygiene that we can do. Um, we need to continue to push for new regulations, laws, and advocacy around legal issues and legal support. And finally, there's a lot that the industry could do. Tech platforms can see a lot here. Um, they could work with security researchers like us at Citizen Lab, as Apple did pushing out the security patch, as WhatsApp did in the case that I mentioned, uh, because uh, frankly, they have a responsibility to provide stewardship over their customers and pay attention to some of these high risk uh, victims. Google recently and other companies started pushing out these warnings to people. These are all good first steps. There's much more that could be done in this area. So with that, I will end it and look forward to Q&A and having a conversation with all of you. Thank you very much. Wow, thanks very much, Ron, for that talk. We've got several questions that have already come in through the chat. Um, so we might start with a few of those, but I just wanted to let everyone who is um, in the room watching know how we'll proceed here. Now, this is the first session of the day, so we're figuring out all the logistics and what works best. Uh, but if you have a question that you would like to ask directly to Ron, you're welcome to raise your hand in the Zoom. And then when we call on you, you'll be able to unmute yourself to ask directly. Uh, you're also welcome to type a question in if you'd like that. Please make sure you do that into the Zoom chat feed, not just the feed loop one, so we can see it easily. Um, and I will get us started with just one of the questions that we we had early on in the presentation, which is, uh, we can use this to start to jump things off and then go from there. Um, but early on, uh, one of the audience members just asked if there is a way to find out as a user if your phone has already been compromised. Start with that and then we'll work through some more. Well, the, the short answer is it's very difficult. Um, I mean, that's what we have spent years trying to refine is the capabilities to uh, try to identify some of the traces of evidence that we can positively confirm. Um, the reality is that uh, when we're speaking of some of the high-end commercial spyware like Pegasus, it's specifically designed to evade forensic detection. Um, it just so happens that we have some means to look back through the logs of Apple products as it stands right now and we've developed methods to identify some of those traces. 
With Android devices, unfortunately, it's not possible for various reasons right now. Um, Amnesty International has a tool that they've developed that can help uh, look at some of the indicators that are in the public of Pegasus and other spying. Um, there's even a, a tool called iMazing, I think, that incorporates some of this. Um, you know, these will give you a, perhaps a partial picture of what may be going on. It's because they're based on previous indicators. And of course the company, as soon as they're exposed, they're not gonna use the same methods. It might tell you something about the past. Um, when we're talking about uh, companies that devote huge resources and um, you know, labor power involving some of the most well-trained engineers who are veterans of, in this case, Israel's Signals Intelligence Agency, um, the, the reality is it's very difficult to identify artifacts of this sort. What I would say to you, um, if you look at the article of Ben Hubbard uh, that was just published, uh, I guess, on Sunday um, in the New York Times, he describes what he does. Um, and, and, you know, it's it's a little discouraging, right? He turns his phone off, off and on. That may help you with persistence um, because um, uh, the spyware uh, may not be able to survive a reboot, um, believe it or not. That's some of the recommendations that people are making around this. Um, but also just keeping your software up to date uh, is a no brainer. And um, maybe separating out your work and your home devices or your sensitive communications from other communications, minimizing your data exposure overall is good. And then just following basic uh, digital security hygiene. Great, thanks. Lots of details there for us. And um, one of the audience members asked whether is there is there really no legislation against selling spy spyware? Well, uh, as I mentioned, there there have been some uh, developments in Europe where uh, European governments are uh, debating precisely that to put in place strong export controls. There was something called the Vossenar arrangement um, that was um, uh, developed in around 2014, I believe. Vossenar is a is an international agreement among a number of states who. Uh, commit to abiding by certain export control policies. Recently, intrusion software was included in that list. Um, the reality though is, you know, you can say you're going to regulate this marketplace and undertake export controls, but it takes, you know, serious effort to do so. Um, in Israel, uh, the surveillance companies actually go through an export licensing process with the Ministry of Defense. The problem is uh, that that uh, regime, if you will, is very permissive. In fact, the belief among many people who observe this area is that um, the sales of NSO groups technology to foreign governments is wrapped up in Israel's strategic foreign policy. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we need to work on that. Canada, for example, uh, mm -hmm. should lead the way here, in my opinion, developing very strong export controls against Canadian surveillance companies. Right now, there really is none because it kind of falls through the cracks. Right. And actually, that's that's a nice segue into a couple of the other questions that seem related to each other. So I'll try and put them together so we can get a few more onto the table here. But um, one, one audience member asked whether Canada has any sort of strategy for dealing with these threats and on a kind of maybe a related one, although they may not be completely, I'll, I'll let you figure out how to bring them together, is that if it's true that NSO, NSO doesn't just sell hacking software like Hacking Team, but actually operates an online hacking service on behalf of its clients, how come its execs haven't been nabbed across various jurisdictions for computer fraud and abuse? Because it's like an arms manufacturer, not only selling missiles, but firing them on behalf of its clients against their enemies. So these all seem sort of tied up in these questions about regulation and what is happening, what should be happening, what can be happening? Yeah, uh, th th those are excellent questions. So the first, you know, frankly, uh, it's disappointing to me in many, Canada really has no, uh, you know, public stance even on this area. Um, it, it, they're silent on it. Um, and uh, I have not seen any evidence that there is serious engagement on the issue, either with respect to foreign policy around it. Um, in other words, you know, mobilizing other countries to do something about these harms or domestically. 
um, in spite of the fact that we had a Canadian permanent resident uh, who happened to be a close confidant of Jamal Khashoggi uh, hacked in this country while he was in Quebec. Uh, if that's not a wake up call, I don't know what would be. Um, you have Citizen Lab based at the University of Toronto almost on a monthly basis pushing out uh, very high profile reports of harm, uh, even lethal consequences connected to this marketplace and not a peep out of uh, the Canadian government. I hope that changes. I think it's vital that countries like Canada lead on this area as opposed to just you know being on the sidelines. And there are probably various reasons for that that I won't get into right now. You know, why aren't NSO executives uh, arrested or detained, charged with computer fraud and abuse? Uh, that's an excellent question. I, I think uh, they should be. Um, I think there should be um, uh, investigations into what they're doing. And it sounds like, based on what I'm reading in the news, that there are. The FBI is investigating precisely that. Um, of course, this, all of this takes time. And this is, in many ways, uh, new territory, right? Um, NSO group which by the way has you know, very deep pockets. Its ownership group is very wealthy um, and uh, they have significant resources to hire PR teams, legal teams, consultants, advisors. Uh, they'll be pushing back against this and their defense is that they're merely providing a service to government clients and oh, by the way, we have uh, strict non-disclosure arrangements. We can't say who our clients are and we can't speak about any of the details because it's all under this veil of national security. And then there's within usually domestic laws around the world, there's most governments have sovereign immunity in some respect. And this kind of falls into that, you know, uh, foggy area of, you know, who can we hold responsible for these so sorts of harms? Um, but I believe we will see some movement when we start, uh, when, when the number of victims based in countries like the UK, France, Canada, United States, uh, once phones get hacked at a high level there, I think there'll be some movement, which was why I pointed out that Department of Justice indictment and the language around it. It was as if taken straight out of something I would write in one of my books. And, um, okay, great. Thank you very much, Ron. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll also read some questions to you. Uh, but first of all, I wanted to thank you for, uh, for your presentation and also thank you for what you're doing because uh, it's not only thought provoking, but it's extremely impactful, not in Canada, but the impact of your work goes uh, across the globe. So one of the questions, I want to link two of the questions uh, here. Um, so I, we want to look at the other side of this technology. And uh, obviously, one of the questions have come up that talks about uh, maybe some of these technologies would be beneficial. It would be, uh, so uh, they're asking if uh, uh, it would seem that government might find the spyware useful in the fight against terrorism, money laundering, and organized crime. And, and as always, the arm in, uh, in hands of criminal uh, in, danger, in dangerous, but in hand of defenders, also, it could help. What is your mm -hmm. view on this? Yeah, I, I would agree. I would say that uh, maybe not this particular technology, but let me begin first by just saying surveillance, surveillance activities, not even surveillance technology, just the mere act of surveillance is very useful. I undertake surveillance when I'm driving my car so I don't run into other cars, right? Citizen Lab undertakes surveillance. We need law enforcement to undertake surveillance for the reasons that the questioner describes. So the problem is not inherently surveillance is bad. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many good uses of surveillance. Surveillance is, I would say, inherent to the human condition. We, we, we need to undertake surveillance to monitor our surroundings. And part of that involves investigating people who are doing criminal acts or present some kind of security risk. The problem is that you need checks and balances. You need to have oversight, accountability, and restraint mechanisms built around those who are taking undertaking surveillance, especially when they are agencies of the state, to prevent the abuse of power. And the problem right now is this technology is being sold to governments without any oversight, uh, without any accountability, largely in the shadows, and uh, in putting it in the hands of government clients that are completely lacking in any public accountability and transparency. So not surprisingly, we're seeing a huge number of these harms. 
I don't think governments will ever give up this technology, which is why I think a global moratorium is unlikely uh, to materialize, even though in spirit, I, I agree with that the harms are so serious, we need to wake people up, but it's not gonna happen because governments need it, law enforcement needs it. Um, but we need to be very careful because this type of technology is extremely powerful. It's uh, building upon an environment that's invasive by design. We carry around with us, all of us, one or more of these devices, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that um, vacuum up details about our personal lives. There's been nothing like that in human history. To have a technology that allows a government client at a push of a button to simply take over any device anywhere in the world they want, that uh, cries out for serious oversight and restraint. And that's my point. Right now, it's missing. So it's not that there aren't good uses of surveillance technology. There are many good uses of it. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your answer. And you somewhat answered some of the other questions, but there is a question that you're asking, would inc uh, wouldn't incentives against deploying a spyware would be a better approach uh, rather than you know policing uh, by the government? I'm not sure what those incentives would look like. I, I think the reality is the world is unfortunately full of bad people and bad people do bad things. And it's very hard to incentivize somebody like Mohammed bin Salman, except by saying, hey, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know what it would be. Um, this is a despot, right? This is a, mm -hmm. a person who's uh, heavily corrupt and has shown a, a clear track record of murdering his political opponents. So incentives aren't going to work around this. I'm not sure what they'd even look like. You know, we live in a world where you need to have rules and laws to prevent bad people from doing bad things and exploiting innocent people. And that's at the heart of this problem. Okay, excellent. So uh, two more questions that are almost related. First of all, uh, ha have Citizen Lab employees been um, uh, targeted uh, by, by some of these, uh, you know, uh, surveillance tools? Yes, yes. So I mentioned the one case of dark matter, the, the company uh, where the US Department of Justice indicted these three Americans work for them. It's now uh, been made public that dark matter targeted us at Citizen Lab. Um, we also were famously targeted by a private intelligence firm called Black Cube. Um, mm -hmm. And we exposed that operation ourselves with a counter sting we organized in New York. Uh, in collaboration with Associated Press. Um, so the answer is yeah, yes, we, we have been targeted. We assume we're being targeted and, and uh, that's just the nature of the business. Um, is there any way to protect researchers? Because uh, one of the questions I wanted to brought up uh, was what is the role of universities, researchers, computer scientists yeah. and engineers? Um, and uh, so if they really put more at the, I mean, if it is type of research is promoted, which it should be, is there a way of protecting them? Yeah, I think the role of the university and academia is critical here because, um, you know, we honestly, there are so many parts of the university right now that are focused on training people for jobs and industry. And I understand that's important, but at the heart of the university is something more fundamental. Um, that's why we have tenure and academic freedom is that we need to investigate problems in society that powerful people wish were exposed. And uh, that's why the university needs to protect groups who are doing this type of research. There aren't many of us actually. I wish there were more citizen labs and many more universities. It's not rocket science. Anybody could do this sort of thing with, uh, and, and our, our methods are peer reviewed. So other people could adopt the same approach. Um, thankfully, the University of Toronto has been very supportive of us, helping us in all sorts of ways from legal to other types of support. Um, we do the best we can to continue to do the work that we do uh, in spite of the risks and threats. And the university has a critical role to play in that regard. Thank you very much. Fantastic. So I think we have time for sort of one more question. And in an effort to get uh, a few of them together, I'll do a little bit of combining because a question has just come in over the chat saying, should there be a communication app developed with secure, security and variability as a top concern? No ability to open links, basic fixtures only for use by people who are in sensitive vocations um, because WhatsApp 
and to some degree even signal prioritized feature development as a consumer app, then vulnerabilities are high. And another question a little bit more general was about, you know, what are the ways in which AI and machine learning figure in this situation? So maybe just to wrap up your thoughts on how some of these some different apps stuff. that are developed and work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, well, you know, what, what's really at the heart of this question is a, is a major problem connected to all of this around, let's call it surveillance capitalism. Uh, basically, we live in an ecosystem where applications, products are constantly pushed out, uh, features built upon features, security is largely an afterthought. Um, I'm sure with the audience here, I'm not saying anything new. This is uh, what you deal with on a daily basis. If we could change that culture, it would help, of course, because what companies are doing are capitalizing on the inevitable number of uh, software flaws, errors in code that can be taken advantage of and weaponized, if you will. So if we could rein in some of that, um, as well as you know, increase privacy uh, laws and regulations and really um, equip uh, privacy commissioners with serious resources and the ability to levy fines, um, I think could change some of the underlying ecosystem that creates an environment ripe for this type of exploitation. Machine learning, artificial intelligence. Well, I think, you know, we are already seeing some of the ways in which these technologies, which hold out great promise, can be easily subverted when in the hands of authoritarians. You may, need only to look at uh, Xinjiang in China to see what I mean by that. The combination of artificial intelligence and facial recognition being used to undertake widespread surveillance. Um, so we have to be very mindful of what companies are doing behind the scenes with these technologies, which is why in part we do the research that we do. We act as a watchdog, right? We open up the black box and figure out what's going on beneath the surface. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for all the, giving us all these things to think about. Um, and I hope that everybody in the room will join me in a virtual round of applause. Thanking Ron for being with us here today. Um, thank you, so, everybody. Yeah, it, it has been really great to have this as the opening for the for the conference keynote.